Hi, I'm Jan Doyle. Welcome to Classroom Connections. I'm really, really happy about this show because it's a continuation. It's part two of another show and two guests that we're having on. Their first guest is Don Ranklin. Did I say Rankin. <laughs> Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. This, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I feel right at yeah. home. You, and uh, the second, <laughs> his wife messes up his name. That's what he just told me. Yep. And our my other guest is uh, Gary Knopf. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad that you're here today. Mm -hmm. And what we were talking about in um, program number one is we left off talking about the mansion in Type Blades. So now, can you just tell us a little bit? Sure. Kind of to give a summary of that, please. Yeah, these were found um, on Old Route 79 in Madison, and it was found by a CELP crew. Um, and the auger was drilling a hole for one of the light posts, and out came all of these points. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the significance. One of the things, really important things, is that they, the material isn't native of Connecticut. Now that's kind of odd that it's not native, being found here. You would right. think it would be. So it, we believe it's a banded slate, which comes from New York State, from the Hudson Valley, uh, Hudson River Valley, and um, we believe that they're around 2,600 to 3,600 years old. So what we were talking about is is getting a picture in your mind of a person or persons going up to this quarry, making these points, and these are called preforms or blanks so that they could bring them down and whoever traded for them would take and fashion them into whatever they wanted to. They would be a spear point or a knife or something like that. That's very interesting. And um, so the, what we were talking about was that there are all these, these trade routes and Don is going to talk a little bit about the geology of Connecticut in regards to these trade routes. Okay, thank you. Don. Okay, well, <laughs> we, uh, we could go back a long time to uh, Pangea with a formation of the United States, but we're going to fast forward to the glacial period. The last glacier, and we think there were at least two other glacial periods where the state of Connecticut was covered over, uh, involved the glacier coming into Connecticut 25,000 years ago. And this has to do with the cycles of the Earth going around the sun and the axial tilt and the Earth spins. Those factors produce the gradual warming and cooling that produces periods of glaciation. So the last period comes in, the glacier comes in, it's moving by gravity from the Labrador of Canada, moving from northwest to southeast, into Connecticut about 25,000 years ago. It gets to the South Fork of Long Island, and the climate is warming, and the glacier continues to move but melts right there, drops off the South Fork of Long Island. Hmm. 2,000 years later, it stabilizes again, and leaves off the North Fork of Long Island. And that would be continuous through the race and through Fishers Island and Charleston. It leaves another recession range in at Hamanasset Beach State Park, 17,300, 300, 400 years ago or so. Right there, right on the water. That's a recessional moraine. Backs out of Connecticut 15,000 years ago and continues on up to Canada. After the removal of the glacier, then you have the frozen tundra, and then you have the tundra grasses forming, and later the boreal forest. But with the grass formation, you have, you have the game coming in, elk, caribou, woolly mammoth, probably the mastodon. We haven't found uh, fossil remains of that. Short-faced bear, giant ground sloth, giant beaver those animals, and in come the Native Americans to hunt. And the earliest habitation site, carbon-14 verified, is in Washington, Connecticut. 10,150 10, years ago, uh, where the Institute of American Indian Studies is. So the large game hunters come in. And we talked a little bit at the other show about the fact that the bow and arrow hadn't been invented yet, or hadn't been introduced yet. So when everybody has this in their mind, that they're, they're sneaking around with a bow and arrow. That's they, exactly they didn't, what I thought. They didn't have it. Um, they were using a stick like this. And if you picture this, this is growing like this. This is just a little shoot that comes off mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. You cut it off there and sharpen it. And this becomes an atlatl. Now, atlatl is the Aztec word for spear thrower. So what they did, now if you, you can imagine um, that 
a hammer, if you try to hammer a nail without the handle, you're not going to do much. Mm -hmm. You put a handle on it and you've got all of that mechanical advantage. So what they did was they took this and they put it on the end of the stick like this and they used the stick to throw the spear. Ah. It gave you an incredible dis difference in distance and power using the atlatl. Ah. So they could take down these large animals. They didn't want to be standing next to them with a handheld spear trying to jab it into a, a woolly mammoth. They wanted to be as far away as possible. Now this is fascinating because this is they took what was available mm -hmm. and started off and then used that. Now I understand you're a master thrower. Is that well, correct? Yeah, I am. Belong Show to us that again because I okay. found that very interesting. Now they use this all around the world. This is an example of one that the Eskimos used. Now wait. Okay, now show, show the camera your hand, how that's made on the hand. You can see that it just very nicely, it's ergonomic. Turn it, it, turn it this way. Um, come more towards me. Do, towards my, good, good. And then I'm going to hold the end. Take your hand out of that for a minute so they can see the formation. Mm -hmm. Now slowly put your hand back in there. Perfect. Now Perfect. they could actually still hold their, kayak, their paddle. And these were used in a kayak. These were used by the Inuit or Eskimos in Alaska over 2,000 years ago. And so when they wanted to load it, they would just take it, slide it in that groove, and they were ready to shoot. Uh, so what this stopped was, it up there? I just heard it stop. With right. Something. There's. You can see that there. That is a. They would use a, a tusk. Um, oh. That happens to be a piece of a deer antler. The real one of these is. This is a replica. The real one is at um, Yukon, um, it stores so, in the museum. So right here where the viewer, that stopped your spear, spear, right. spear. And oh, because so I could hear it. Yes, I could hear, hear that. Now then this is loaded and now they would throw it, they would shoot a, at a seal or walrus or whatever. Oh, isn't that interesting? And so that's this, that would be what I call Inuit. Uh, this happens to be Aztec. The real one is in a museum in Italy. Cortez brought it back as a souvenir when he conquered the Aztecs. I'm going to have I'm going to have <clears> you hold it facing this way so the camera could come in closely on this. And I'd like them to notice right here on the camera. Um, what are these for? To stop it again? These are to stop it again. And what's unique about this is the fact that it shoots two at once. Oh, that is interesting. So this is a double barrel atlatl like a double barrel shotgun. shotgun. So, I'm going to have you turn it over since the camera's right here. And can you explain these markings? Yeah, the, the one in the museum is ornately carved even more so than you this. Just took it, I'm going to hold it up there. Okay. Go, okay. And it was all gilded in real gold. So this is, do these markings make, may mean anything or is it just deco decorative? These are just decorative, yeah. Very. But, um, so the Aztecs had them, the Mayans used them. The Aztecs actually had the bow and arrow also. But they chose to continue using the atlatl. And how does that work again? Show us how that one works. Well, you put two in. Two in. One here and one there. Put them together. And now when you fire these, you fire two at once. Oh, wow. Just like that. So that if, like you had a, if you had a tribe, you had you know, 10 people in your army, you're, you're now doubled your army because you're now throwing 20 spears in the air rather than only 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, in um, Australia, they call it a Woomera, and the, in the movie Crocodile Dundee, when he was meeting the Aborigines, they were both holding atlatls. I know the movie. Yeah. So next time you see the movie. <laughs> who, who knew I had? <clears throat> yes. Now, did you show us the, the one up, th that one? Okay, yes. this one here, this is the one I use in competition. Um, it has a weight on it, and the significance of the weight is that you have this much spear in ahead of you, and this offsets that weight so that it's easier to hold and it's easier to, um, to balance. Because when I'm shooting at something, if I'm a quarter of an inch off here, by the time it gets to the target, it's a foot off. Okay, let's show that close up in the camera, then the weight of your, the, um, <clears throat> and then, we, so I'm gonna bring the, and so this is the weight you that is offsetting. I'm gonna wait till the camera comes in tight on this so we can see this. There it goes. So when they both have one. Right. Oh, now it, it, did so this you? is a little, just a little bit different. Um, this does exactly the same thing. 
This was one that I made for Don. But you know, <coughs> he, you, I didn't realize you threw a We're friends. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. why we determined you had a friend. That's right. Right, yeah, right. One. I could. So good. I say I belong to the World Atlatl Association. It's an organization <coughs> dedicated to, to uh, educating people about the atlatl. Um, I happen to be currently the president of the International Atlatl Association. I was in Wyoming a couple weeks ago. I was in New York State last weekend. And then we compete with a standardized contest. It's a like an archery target, and we shoot five shots at 15 meters and five shots at 20 meters, and then you can compare your scores all around the, all around the world. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now, is that just for men to compete? Oh, no. <clears throat> we, have, um, um, we have three divisions. We have the men's division, the women's, and then the youth. And what are the ages of the youth? It is up to um, fifth, age 15. And it starts at what age? Oh, I have kids. Don and I do a lot of um, throws for the public. And we've had kids as young as five or six years old mm -hmm. actually able to, to use an atlatl and throw. And I imagine they're geared towards a child's body. There are different proportions. A, yeah, we use a little bit smaller one, and, and the spears are a little smaller. And we call the spears darts to try to differentiate them from the handheld spear. Um, but um, yeah, and I make all of the, I make all of these things. <laughs> you make the spears? Yeah. spears. I'm not saying the word right. Spears. Yep. And if you just how do you hand me that, this, that. How do you make them? Well, this is called uh, river cane, and um, and actually some of them I use um, bamboo from. I was wondering, is that that's not bamboo? It's not. It's it's a type of bamboo, but it's it grows a little bit longer than. There's shorter areas between the nodes here. Uh, these dark spots are where I heat it up to straighten it. Now what they used to do is they would make a whole bunch of these four shafts and they would socket them like that. Mm. So they went into the animal and they pulled it out. This would stay in the animal. Then they'd just take another one of these out of their pouch, put it in, and then they'd be ready to shoot it again. So they wouldn't oh, need a whole clever. lot of these and they would just make a whole bunch that's of these. That's very clever. That is, how did you figure that out? How did you know They've that? They've actually found these in dry caves in the Midwest, in the Great Basin area. That they've actually found the four shafts, they found the, um, the arrows, or the, the, the darts, and um, they found them with, they've actually found atlatls with the weights still attached. Oh, that's very <coughs> clever. Very, very clever. What are those that you have, those items you have up there? <clears throat> Don, you wanna talk about that oh, one? Sure. <clears throat> so, we um, we do uh, programs out at Meg's Point Nature Center, archaeology, open houses. That now, where is Meg's Point? <clears throat> it's part of Hammonasset Beach State Park, and Meg's Point Nature Center is way out at Meg's Point. You were out there for one of the programs. The bird people, I think. Yes, right? and cool. actually, if people aren't familiar with it or they don't take advantage of it, <clears throat> they really might want to consider it because it is a phenomenal resource for the area. And I love it. How do it people is. find out about the activities at Meg's Point? Well, there's a website. It's hammonasset.org, mm -hmm. and they can go there and they can see the activities of Makes Point Nature Center. They can see the uh, activities of the Friends of Hammonasset, like the big Makes Point Festival, the New England at Laddle Championships. I, we're repeating from last the last show, but there will be primitive technology people there showing the techniques for, for flint napping and so on. There will be geology exhibits, paleontology exhibits, live bird shows, free music. Tom Callanan's performing, the Kerry Boys. Free admission to the park, free event, free parking. Free is a good price, yeah. too. Sponsored by Liberty Bank, by the way, and didn't mention that they've been a big supporter of our activity. Oh, so that's Liberty huge. Bank is, is a big supporter of ours. Now, you're a member of the Hammond Asset. Um, Gary and I are both uh, members of the Friends of Hammond Asset and the Friends of the Office of State Archaeology, sure. Okay, so. and so, and you're also. You're hugely involved, and in, I mean, you're not just, you don't just, you're not, for, you're not members in name only. Well, I'm in charge of fundraising, so I'm the, there's got to be somebody that's a little bit mentally off to just set up all these things, but I'm one of those. But I, I grew up working for my uncle in a nursery, and so we sell shrubs and flowers and hanging baskets, and we, we do very well out there. Mm -hmm. And actually, we have our mum sale. I don't know when this is going to show. That starts September 3rd, runs for about four weeks. So if you want to support, if you believe in what Gary and I are doing and you want to buy the mums from the Friends of Hammond Asset, it all goes to support environmental education. The main purpose of the Friends of Hammond Asset is to provide environmental education. Pre preservation of natural resources and to support the park in a general way are the second and third 
The Friends of the Office of State Archaeology, what Gary talked about in the first program, is really support the state archaeology and his functions. I have to tell you, when I've been to pro I've been going to programs for for actually several years, but I think the mo one of the nicest uh, item that I or the nicest thing that I observe are little kids when they see some of these things for the first time and they're so excited about it and. Mm. And that is really kind of what it's all about because you never know what's germ or not, what little seed you're planting in a child that's going to take place years later. So it, it really is important stuff. Ab so, you know, absolutely. I, yeah. Gary was talking about young kids. My grandchildren have been throwing the spears since they were probably four or five years old. And they, they look for arrowheads they, they, uh, and they make them themselves mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they're they're interested and so that maybe they'll lose interest as they go on to college and so on but for now it's a way to connect with history in a very real experience experiential way you're mm -hmm. you're tossing the spear like all of our ancestors did all of us evolved from hunter-gatherers we think that evolved the technology 30 35,000 years ago so we all we all evolved from hunter-gatherers using the atlatl mm -hmm. and the spear. Mm -hmm. And so it's a way of connecting to our past. We honor all of that. That's where I, I have to tell you, I found this very interesting. It's fascinating. And you, it, it, I really did, because I just was so ignorant on this particular subject, and I just found this very, very fascinating. But I did, I did want okay. to have an opportunity to okay. talk about so, this. So, Jan, this is... So, when we do shows, we connect with people, and we connected with somebody that wanted to donate some artifacts, and so we accepted them, and these were donated, of course, uh, as I told you before. This is a stone axe. This is a chert flint material light substance. This was discovered in Denmark, and we now think that this is, could be four to 6,000 years old. The Bronze Age in Denmark, and it varies de and depending upon the part of Europe or Africa you came from, but the Bronze Age was about 2,000 years, 1,800 years before Christ. But before that, we think that this is what the material would have been used to make a stone axe. So this is an axe. So this would have been used like this. Okay, so the point is... Now, that's is, not, my, not my definition of an axe, actually. Okay. The way, the way you're... I, I'm not sure what I would call that, but it's, I, I consider axe. an axe with a... Well, this would, have, this would be connected to a shaft. Gary can talk more about yeah. that than I, and used as an axe. If yeah. you picture this split and then wrapped around this and then this would be wrapped uh, with sinew so this would be nice. on a it would look like that. oh oh, oh <clears> how now simple. they also sometimes hafted them this way oh they would wrap this around and then they would use it as an ads and they would use it to, to dig out like if they were making a, a dugout canoe they would use it this way oh that's interesting how did you get this if it came from Denmark? Well, it was part of this gentleman's collection. He was in his 80s, and he it wanted to pass. It was his father, I believe. Oh, it was his father. That collected. We have some other artifacts that were discovered in Denmark as well, plus many from southern New England. So we, we use those in our archaeology roadshow. So we, we do stuff at museums and libraries and so on. What Here's treasures? another collection right over there that was donated. This one? That's from Hammonasset Lake. The Hammonasset River was dammed up just north. Whoops. Uh, just north of Route 80 to provide a, a water supply for New Haven. And so when the water levels in that lake would be low, this gentleman uh, began collecting these in the 60s as a high school student and then just recently uh, donated these. And all but um, three or f all but these little ones in the bottom would have been used with the atlatl, not a bow and arrow. Isn't that interesting? So this was one gentleman's private collection and he wanted it used. It's, the thing about it is, I mean, I honor... You know, the LP body, Yale, and all the big institutions and everything. But right now, if we receive artifacts, they're going to be used. I mean, here we are talking to Jan Doyle, you know, mm -hmm. and here they are. So people are seeing them. They're not tucked away in some drawer someplace collecting dust. You know, that's people a, are learning about what you know, we're doing. That's the thought that I just had, that someone had the foresight and the generosity to give this to the, actually to the world not, yes. instead of keeping them because yeah. they honestly... They could have, yeah. and and by donating them, and I, I'm sure they understand what a valuable resource it is to many. And, and to be clear, these th this becomes state property, the state of Connecticut, and these <clears throat> this collection for the viewers, anyone watching, this normally lives at Makes Point Nature Center. So you come in Makes Point Nature Center, 
and just turn immediately to the left, there's a beautiful exhibit, a diorama of Native American artifacts and settings and so on uh, that's right there at the Nature Center. And the state is funding a brand new Nature Center, so we'll have more exhibits on archaeology and the history of Hammonasset Beach State Park, which, by the way, Jan, is a very what we call sensitive land from the standpoint of Native American habitation. We know Native Americans lived in the park going back nine or 10,000 years. We have found, not me or Gary, but others have found paleo points that identify an early residence and they were the hunter-gatherers at that point. They didn't start living in camps until like 7,000 years ago. Are those marked in the park, those areas? Oh, we wouldn't, I, they should never be marked because then you have people going out to yeah. try to scoop them up or gather more stuff. So archaeology mm -hmm. sites are That's protected, you know, so we don't like to give that information out. And... Uh, that's the function of the archaeology is to protect all these sites because you have a lot of people that enjoy collecting them, and that was one of the it's one of the problems of, of archaeology. You have amateurs that will go into a new site and disturb it, and, it, and when the context has <clears throat> changed, then it's hard to make the interpretation. So the proper thing, if somebody f discovers a point, they they could get in touch with me, Don Rankin or Gary or you, and and get somebody in f involved that knows what they're talking about so we can look at what's going on and then we might get in touch with a state archaeologist and then we might do some test pits right there to just see again if there was an evidence of a camp or village site or a paleo site that's really early nine nine to eleven thousand years ago in the state of connecticut or something else of interest well you're bringing up a very interesting point that i think a lot of people might think there's big money if they go and find something like this and so therefore they want to yeah. get to that spot before anybody else get and they're going to take out and you you were yeah. shaking your head i don't know if they saw no, that there, on there really so. isn't a, a large market you can go on ebay and you can see um, that there are there, there are points for sale. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are the are more Western, and you have to be very careful. There, are, when I, this weekend when I was in New York State, it was a, a tone a stone tool show, where there must have been 50 people flint napping. They were making points more meticulous. See, the the Native Americans they made them practical. They didn't care if they weren't totally symmetrical. If they were sharp and they fit on the end of the stick and they worked, they used them. They used well, them. these people are making them total, per perfectly symmetrical. I mean, I made this one, and this one isn't real symmetrical, um, but it's you know it's it's serviceable, and um, does the job. We use that on Thanksgiving. Gary made that for me. <laughs> I made that for Dad. It actually works. I, I actually do that. Yeah, but um, <laughs> that's cute. That's right yeah. in my hand. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so the, so that's good so. to know because people there's always people out there you got to kind of watch and um, and that's good to know that they're not going to be able to get rich yeah. off this no. and there's there's so much culture and so much yeah. educational. See, value. once it's dug up, it's done. It's it's gone because you lose all the context. You don't know what layer it was found. You don't know it was found next to some you know, organic material that you can carbon date and tell exactly how old it is. Oh, is so once you take it out of the ground, it's done. It's a pretty rock then. And it doesn't tell a story. One of my favorite stories is, is a shell midden in Westbrook we did. Um, it's is a what? A shell midden. And what that is is what they, it was their garbage dump. Mm -hmm. It's where they threw their shells after they ate their clams. But by carefully digging, we found a hearth, which are stones like this, all laid at the bottom. They build their fire, and we found post molds where they had put posts in the ground, and they either pulled them out or they disintegrated. And you could see these round all around the, the pit. And what you just can imagine was they were roasting. They built this little thing over top of the, the fire, and they were roasting their oysters and throwing them over their shoulder. And it just told a story. And we didn't find any arrowheads. There were nothing like that. It was just a, an incredible story that was being unfolded by doing it that careful and that. Um, and we could, there was charcoal, and it was dated. It was a late woodland site. It was around 600 years old, something like that. Oh, that is, that is an it was incredible neat. story. And I can, while you're talking, I can just picture it. it's kind of like what we used to do with kids with watermelon seeds. Yeah. You know, it's the same yep. they were using oysters yep. yeah. um, or clams. Is Now, we only have about two minutes left. Do you want to talk about this? Yes, yeah. I oh, do. Just real quickly. So this, 
was discovered at the Bauer farm. They had they had plowed an area for community gardeners. You know, they take 20 by 20 This is plots. in Madison. In Madison, yeah. So I went over there maybe five or six years ago, and uh, it had rained, so it was a good time to look for quartz, and that's what I was looking for. But I found this, and I picked it up, and I went like this, and I said, holy Toledo, look at this. What this is is an ads. This would have been hafted to a shaft and maybe used to, to make a dugout canoe where they burned like light wood. Like Could you it, spell that word as? It's an as? A Z or A Z E. Okay. I, I've seen it spelled different ways. So yeah, right. with an E or without an E, an as. Okay. There's a D in there too. A A Z D E. Well, that's okay. Whatever. It's yeah. an ads. And, and ads. I'm sorry. A D Z or A D Z E and ads. Because these are words I haven't yeah. heard before. A D Z or A D Z E. I've sp I've seen it spelled both ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at any rate, so I found it. And, you know, I think I called Gary right away. I said, Gary, you're not going to believe it. I was so excited. We went out for dinner. And I came up to people. I said, you're not going to believe what. And they looked at me as some crazy person. But and, anyway. And I can understand yeah. that. Yeah. And, and I can understand that, but too. But you don't it's find any of these. Yeah. I, mean, and just, I mean, for me, I mean, it's like going out and playing, like I said in the first show, like playing golf and shooting a hole in one in the, the, the third hole. Yeah. And you're just learning, you know. And I found these two things. This is the quartz scraper. We talked about that in the first show. This is evidence of a ground, of a... Um, bifacial chipped or flaked that Gary talked about. This is a ground tool. This would have been ground this way and that way to create that cutting surface. So this is an ad. So this could be a thousand years old or even earlier. And, and the important thing is that Native Where? Americans, all the farms up and down the east, you know, coast, they were all farmed by Native Americans. So any colonial farm had been farmed by, keep in mind, Native Americans were here for 10,000 years. I hate to say this to you. We have less than a minute left, okay. so okay. I, I'm just going to have to cut you off. Okay. But I hope, hopefully, we'll see you again here on Classroom oh, Connections. Yeah. It, was fun. it was fascinating program. I'm learning a lot, and I want to thank you so much. And I want you to remember these faces because if you see them out in the real world, attend one of their shows, and you give lectures to children yeah. and talks mm -hmm. all around. Go to the website. Go to the Friends of Hammond Acid. Yeah. And then, if you're interested in state archaeology, go to the FOSA. Friends of the Office of State Archaeology website, and there's all yeah. kinds of stuff that people can get involved with. They can become involved with editing, editing the paper, or going out on the digs with us. Or Great doing idea. All different kinds Thank of things. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank and you. I hope I see you both again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We also started, um, I know we're done, right? Yeah. Just, yes. Yeah.